humanity. Today, we welcome Dr. Teresa Casal from University of Lisbon, who is going to speak about fiction and health humanity, in particular with a lecture entitled Imagining Myself Out of Myself, Uses of Fiction and Memoir in Health Humanity. This fifth lecture of the Faces of the Health Humanities series hosted by Ilki Trisco Prose will see Teresa to contribute to a closer appreciation of how memoir and fiction represent experiences of illness and grief and how readers engage with them. She will draw on literary works written on the thin line between memoir and fiction to consider the question they raise on the power and limitation of fiction and memoir. Are there limits to the testimonial power of memoir? Can the artifice of fiction its power to shift the perspective and the step into others' minds prove enabling to articulate otherwise inarticulate experience? Are the differences in the writing of memoir and fiction replicated in the reading of each form? I'm sure we are going to find interesting answers to this question. But before, <laughs> the technical information and details. Um, all our lectures are recorded because we often have had people ask if it is possible to have access to them afterward because they cannot attend at this time. So the lectures are therefore available on YouTube. If you do not want to appear on the screen, please turn your camera off. I also kindly ask you to mute your microphones so that there is no interference during Teresa's lecture. Of course, there will be time for questions after the lecture. So you can either raise your virtual hand so that we can see that you want to ask a question or alternatively, you can send the question through the chat if you do not want to appear. Some of the students have asked if they can have a certificate of attendance and yes, it's possible. You just have to email us to uh, ipietrisco email. The last thing to add, our next lecture, which will be focused on theater and health humanities and will be on November 8 with Marina and Roberto Totola in dialogue with Cidia Fiorato, Lee Miller, and Bob Wallace. Now, without any further hesitation, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Teresa Casal, who holds a PhD in literary studies. She's assistant professor in English at the University of Lisbon and a member of the Medical Humanities team based at the University of Lisbon Center for English Studies. Her research interests in medical humanities include illness and grief narratives and the use of fiction and memoir in the education of a health professional. She has also co-edited Beyond the Diane Images, relating the person to the patient, the patient to the person. So I'm happy to welcome you, Teresa, and to give, the, uh, to give you the opportunity to uh, talk about your interesting lecture. Thank you very, very much, Camilla. Uh, thank you all for taking time out of busy life to um, join us uh, this evening. Um, and uh, I would like to particularly thank uh, Professor Carmela Pierini, who is chairing this session, uh, Professor Rossella Ricobono, who is also <laughs> co-chairing the session from behind the scenes, um, Professor Chiara Battisti, and also my dear colleague uh, from the University of Lisbon, Cecilia Vicio Martins, Thanks to all of you, this um, collaboration, this bridge between Italy and Portugal has been established and it's uh, an honor and a privilege to be part of it. Mm. So, um, as you all know, the introduction of health humanities into the training of healthcare professionals 
proceeds from the awareness of how important it is to better understand the complex predicament of professionals and patients, as well as the intersubjective nature of their relations. As argued by Nicole Piemonte, the use of the humanities in healthcare education aims to teach by direction. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Using literature, so the slide, uh, please. Using literature, narrative, film, poetry, photography, and art to facilitate reflection and dialogue engages, yeah, <laughs> engages students' moral imagination and safely guides them back to the human elements of suffering from which many would rather flee. And she adds, teaching by indirection through artistic representation can open students up to new horizons of understanding, revealing to them what it might be like to live with a serious illness or injury. And yet, as she also pointedly reminds us, one can only ever approach the suffering of the other. One cannot experience the same suffering in the same way. Each discipline brings a specific approach and insight into the complex web of relations involved in healthcare. I've been fortunate enough to be part of an interdisciplinary team based at the University of Lisbon and led by Professor Isabel Fernandes, which has given me the opportunity to work with colleagues from various disciplines and learn from them. My particular contribution comes from the study of fictional and non-fictional narratives and from the use of the methods proposed by narrative medicine in the training of medical and nursing students and in reading and writing groups with healthcare professionals. As has been acknowledged, next slide please, narrative in the contemporary health professions curriculum is interdisciplinary in both nature and application. Its tenets appear in patient interviewing, in making deeper sense of the medical record, in acts of diagnosing, and in the in psychosocial aspects of patienthood. Moreover, narrative inquiry is also the source of an explosion of reflective writing across the curriculum. Despite the ubiquity of narrative and the diagnostic encounter, therapeutic practice, education of patients and professionals, and in research, the use of literature and the arts in the education of healthcare professionals still meets with suspicion or uh, at least hesitation in some quarters. The assumption underlying such suspicion is that the main aim will be to help develop empathy and that it is too naive to assume that reading stories in a book or watching them on a screen will be so enlightening that it will prompt a change in one's attitudes and behaviour. This rests on a passive understanding of reading, as if reading would automatically prompt an empathetic awareness that would in turn translate into action. In fact, empathy is not the sole mode of engagement with the text, nor is it the only one that may be helpful to those involved in healthcare. As literary critic Rita Felsky reminds us, empathy is just one of the ways in which readers and viewers identify with characters and there are different kinds of identification empathic but also ambivalent or ironic and she adds next slide please audiences become attached to fiction in an abundance of ways these ties can be ironic as well as sentimental ethical as well as emotional neither do we need the illusion of reality to identify an assumption that fails to account for attachments to Box Bunny, Cinderella, Vladimir and Estragon. The draw of character has far less to do with realism than with qualities of vividness and distinctiveness. Awareness of how we respond to a text or image is part of what narrative medicine wants to promote. Its methodology, next slide please, rests on an active and multifaceted practice that involves reading and discussing fictional or non-fictional stories to develop observational and listening skills, writing to shape an externalized thought, and sharing what we write to receive others' insights that may be revealing to ourselves. This is a process that promotes awareness of how each of us brings their subjectivity into play in our assessment of a particular situation, 
which should encourage awareness both of our strengths and of our biases and cognitive traps, as uh, Jerome Groupman calls them. As Maura Spiegel and Daniel Spencer from Columbia point out, recognition that what one hears in someone else's story can depend on one's own experiences and state of mind can change everything, can be culture change. However, though the cornerstone of narrative medicine is this multifaceted use of narratives to bring insight and awareness into the experience of patients and professionals, and though narrative is broadly understood to include literature and memoir alongside films, documentaries, and images, deciding on whether to use fictional or non-fictional narratives usually rests on unexamined assumptions about which form is trusted to have an impact on its readers, whether we place our trust on illness memoirs for their testimonial power and or on literary fiction for the imaginative liberty that can be used by skilled writers to explore multiple points of view. So given those unexamined assumptions, my hope today is to contribute to a closer appreciation of how memoir and fiction can respectively represent experiences of illness and suffering and how readers engage with them. To that effect, I will draw on two literary works written on the thin line between memoir and fiction to consider the insights that they provide and the questions they raise on the power and limitations of fiction and memoir. Next slide, please. So the questions, are there limits to the testimonial power of memoir? And can what Rutafelsky calls the affordances of fiction, namely sneaking into the minds of strangers to capture fragile wisps of thought and feeling, prove enabling to articulate otherwise inarticulate experience, and finally, are the differences in the writing of memoir and fiction replicated in how we read each form? I will proceed inductively, weaving narrative and reflection, and that will be the core of the talk, before I attempt to frame this case study within the wider framework of health humanities. Next slide, please. I will start with the key questions raised by Lucy Caldwell's short story, Multitudes, and Colm Tabin's novel, Nora Webster, both of which are admittedly informed by the author's autobiographical experience. Next slide, please. So I'll start with Multitudes. For the first time in my life, fiction has failed me. I can't imagine myself out of myself or even imagine doing so. These are arresting lines. They make us wonder why fiction failed a narrator and what fiction requires of the writer and of the reader and whether and how that differs from the requirements of autobiography. These lines belong to the first person narrator of Caldwell's story, Multitudes, which is the last in her first collection. Given the volume's subtitle, 11 stories, it is fair to assume that these stories are fiction, not memoir. Even those of us not versed in the intricacies of literary studies will know that the fundamental difference between fiction and autobiography is that in fiction, the author and the narrator are different entities, whereas in any autobiographical form, be it memoir, diaries, letters, the narrator coincides with the author. In the case of Multitudes 11 stories, we assume that the various first and second person narrators do not coincide with Caldwell herself. Yet the title story is markedly different from the 10 stories that preceded. Next slide, please. It is a first person narrative structured into 15 fragments titled in capital letters. It's told in the present tense by the parent of a newborn child with a life threatening condition. Does that Though other stories use the present tense for the sake of immediacy, they often include a retrospective or prospective look. Yet multitudes plunges us into the urgent immediacy of the present tense of a first person narrator that is sometimes plural, we, and sometimes singular. Next slide. The consultant comes into the room with eight or nine others. We are so new to this, barely 24 hours new. We don't yet know what this augurs. The story is fragmentary, precisely because it is written from the present. 
indeed from a present of utter uncertainty and under the threat of being robbed of the anticipated future. It is out of this present that the narrator admits, um, next slide please, um, that for the first time in my life, fiction has failed me. These lines suggest that fiction failed the narrator as she faces her newborn baby's life-threatening condition, and that this failure has to do with her present inability to imagine herself out of herself. This raises questions that have to do with the nature of fiction and with our needs and priorities when facing challenging conditions. Next slide, please. First, does Caldwell's narrator suggest that fiction is about imagining oneself out of oneself? If so, does this apply to the writer as well as to the reader of fiction? Secondly, what is and what is not helpful when we are immersed in a highly disruptive predicament such as Caldwell's narrator? Are other stories helpful when we cannot imagine ourselves out of ourselves? And if fiction fails the narrator, can personal testimony help? Two additional points can help us frame these questions. The first has to do with the status of Caldwell's story as fiction or memoir. And the second has to do with the abundant testimonies of the need felt by many faced with serious illness or bereavement to read stories of others facing similar predicaments. Illness and grief memoirs written by fiction writers often mentioned the surge to read others' memoirs when faced with illness and bereavement, and I'll return to this at the end. As to the status of multitudes, Caldwell has spoken of its autobiographical sources in interviews. The story draws on her experience of her newborn son's life-threatening condition, next slide please, and tells how its fragmentary structure and immediacy stemmed from the urgency and the timing of the writing. She says, I wrote the story in bursts. I wrote it on my iPhone at 4 a.m., breastfeeding, standing at the kitchen counter with my baby sleeping in a sling. It felt utterly transgressive to watch something so closely autobiographical. And yet, at the same time, utterly necessary. It felt like writing for survival. And then she also says, so the experimental form of it, this intense burst, seemed to fit both the way it was composed and the experience I was trying to evoke. So she acknowledges how transgressive it felt, uh, just as she addresses the formal challenge of how to articulate the raw experience of life-threatening illness and uncertainty. In other words, to articulate what Arthur Frank calls the chaos story. Next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. Um, the teller of chaos stories is preeminently the wounded storyteller, but those who are truly living the chaos cannot tell it in words. For a person to gain such a reflective grasp of her own life, distance is a prerequisite. Caldwell's information about when and how she wrote the story reframes our consideration of the failure of fiction. Seemingly, Fiction failed the narrator as a fiction writer in the heart of chaos. But two questions remain. Next slide, please. If the writing of fiction requires that I imagine myself out of myself, does the reading of fiction require the same? And conversely, if the writing of memoir does not require that I imagine myself out of myself, does the reading of memoir not require the same? <clears throat> Um, all the in the thick of experience, Caldwell is unable to imagine herself out of herself. I suggest that that is precisely what her stories, whether fictional or closely autobiographical, ask of their readers, that we imagine ourselves out of ourselves. Caldwell describes the process of writing fiction when discussing her first play, Leeds, about teenage suicide. In a conversation with the mother of Neve Louise McKee, who killed herself when she was 15, Caldwell explains, next slide please, that she had written the play because she believes that fiction could, can, go into the darkest corners of the psyche and bring back from there something true or shameful or hidden or otherwise inexpressible. To do so, 
she had, she Caldwell had to go into the darkest corners of herself to bring someone back from the brink and have them articulate what they'd done or wanted to do or why, though they might never be able to say it. Her account of the writing illuminates what she felt unable to do amidst her child's life-threatening illness. This failure has as much to say about the experience of illness as it does about narrative, both fiction and memoir. Next slide, please. It points to the, so first it points to the disruption of certainty brought about by serious illness and grief, about the chaos that they precipitate by uprooting them people and plunging them into a foreign land. This uprooting resists a linear narrative arc so that the narrator speaks from an endless present tense of minute to minute survival that can at best be told in disjointed fragments. Hence the impossibility of changing perspective and the need to plunder her reservoirs. Secondly, this failure of fiction highlights what fiction is about, namely perspective a stepping outside of oneself to explore other ways of seeing uh, and experiencing the world, even as we activate our reservoirs of experience to do so. It is by using our own resources that we can imaginatively engage with fiction, the writing, but also the reading of it. And it is by remaining open to the newness of other perspectives that we enrich our own in an interplay between foreignness and familiarity. Thirdly, the way fiction fails the narrator makes us wonder about the difference between reading multitudes as life writing, as memoir or fiction. For the reader, the key difference between memoir and fiction rests on the testimonial power of memoir, which may make additional ethical claims on readers. We cannot dismiss it lightly and may be all the more compelled to consider it. And yet, some of us may prefer the relative detachment afforded by fiction. As the Irish novelist uh, Eilish McQuivner points out, next slide please, in the hands of a skilled writer, the memoirs of illness or of grief and loss use the techniques of the novelist. The writing of Caldwell's story involved formal options so as to bring us imaginatively as close as possible to these parents' predicament, regardless of whether we read it as fictional or as closely autobiographical. In the case of multitudes, these formal options include the relentless immersion in a claustrophobic here and now, the meticulous intensity of the, this account from the kingdom of the sick. Like other stories in the collection, it hits home, as noted by Claire Kilvoy, and next slide, please. An event does not have to be newsworthy to be devastating. This is a collection about ordinary calamities, which is precisely why it hits home. The language is unadorned and colloquial. The voices are funny and sweet and vulnerable. Multitudes is essentially in study and vulnerability. Despite how low-key the settings are, I read multitudes with my heart in my mouth, anxious for these people, particularly the young ones. Kilroy's embodied review acknowledges what is often silenced in literary criticism, but is key to the use of literature in health humanities. How stories hit home when they succeed in activating our imaginative, affective, cognitive, and ethical engagement with them. How in the case of Caldwell's stories, the character's vulnerability evokes our own experiences of vulnerability though they may proceed from very different circumstances. And how important it is to become aware both of what goes on in the story and of our responses to it. Next slide, please. So let us move now to Tabin's novel, Nora Webster, uh, his most autobiographical novel to date. It's a third person narrative of the widowed Nora, who is left with four young children when a husband dies of cancer. And it draws on Tabine's father's premature death and its impact on the family. In an article in The Guardian, next slide please, Tabine explains that it had initially tried to write the story from his own point of view as a child, but as his experience was too filled with silence and he ended up choosing to tell the story from his mother's point of view or from her fictional alter ego, um, Nora. Uh, 
the legacy, he talks about the legacy of silence and distance. And this legacy points to the embodied impact of grief on children who lack the language to articulate it, so much so that decades later, it continues to resist narrative. So for narrative to emerge, to be needs to change perspective and use the liberties of fiction to imagine himself as a young widow. Next slide, please. Two aspects about Nora Webster are of particular relevance to the uses of literature and film in health humanities. The structural option of using the device of fiction to shift perspective from self to other, and the scenes in the novel when mother and sons watch films together, and how these grown up films that do not mirror the particular situation of the family. Um, <clears throat> nonetheless present the viewers with an emotional landscape that provides a shock of recognition in mother and sons. The impact of Tobin's shift in perspective will strike readers familiar with his work. In fact, Nara Webster revisits an episode seemingly from his uh, childhood that also features in the short story One Minus One and the novel The Hath of Lazy. Let us compare how that particular episode is rendered in the short story from the point of view of the adult son stuck in his childhood emotions, and then how it is rendered through dialogue in Nora Webster. The episode is about the time when the two boys were left in the care of an aunt during their father's illness and didn't hear from their mother for what felt like a very long time. In one minus one, the adult narrator reminisces about his mother's death six years earlier and evokes that unhealed childhood memory. Next slide, please. Nobody did us any harm in that house. Nobody came near us in the night or hit either of us or threatened us or made us afraid. The time we were left by our mother in our aunt's house has no drama attached to it. It was all grayness, strangeness. Our aunt dealt with us in her own destructive way. And all I know is that our mother did not get in touch with us once, not once, during this time. There was no letter or phone call or visit. Our father was in the hospital. We did not know how long we were going to be left there. In the years that followed, our mother never explained her absence, and we never asked her if she'd wondered how we were or how we felt during those months. But no one harmed us or made us afraid. Uh, or because no one harmed us, it did not strike us that we were in a world where nobody loved us uh, and that such a thing might be of any significance. Now, the taught syntax makes space for the silence out of which this first person narrator tries to tell what adults' distraction had left unacknowledged and frozen in silence. The narrator finds his words in an imagined conversation with a past lover. By trying to make it shareable with a listener, the narrator makes it intelligible to himself. As Spiegel and Spencer note, next slide, please. Next slide, please. The story's quiet urgency builds on the onrush of delayed feeling and the narrator's need to tell and be heard, even if the listener is merely imagined. Indeed, the presence of the absent listener becomes palpably real to the reader over the course of the story. Sorry, it's, um, it's a previous slide. <laughs> uh, okay, it's a previous slide. Uh, no, it's previous before. But anyway, uh, and then, um, yeah, okay, this one uh, is, the, is the one I need now. So Spiegel and Spencer also add, the story locates the reader in a shaped world where we can feel the cumulative weight of things left unsaid, and it rouses us to give language to our experience of and reflections on the story, to linger in that intersubjective space created by the narrator's voice. Sorry. So they argue uh, that to medical students lingering in that intersubjective space may be an invitation to consider the co-constructive and intersubjective space of the clinical encounter. For, and I'm quoting, the listener or clinician contributes to and even shapes what the teller is able to formulate or express. In Nora Webster, 
Contabine uses fiction to return to that childhood memory. Yet instead of featuring the enabling listener that we find in one minus one, he revisits the episode in a dialogue between Nora and Aunt Josie. And Josie here performs a double role. She alerts Nora to the emotional consequences of the children's feeling of abandonment and thus acts as her, their advocate. And she makes room for Nora to voice her helplessness. Next slide, please. Yeah. I don't know what you were thinking of, leaving them here all that time and never once coming to see them. Morris was sighing. Connor went to bed most nights. I don't know what you were thinking of, leaving them here all that time. I had no choice. There we are then. Did you think they would come home and change? Unlike what happens in the story, where adults' distraction overlooks children's emotional reality and, and reinforces their sense of abandonment, in our Webster, Tabine uses dialogue to dramatize different points of view about the same episode. As the only adult, adult aware of the boy's predicament, Josie shakes Nora out of her exclusive focus on her husband until she acknowledges the impact of her decision on her children. At the same time, Nora has a chance to voice her own side of the story. The reader may then realize that Nora's failure consisted in overlooking the implications of her decision on all those affected by it. Yet Josie's remark, I don't know what you were thinking of, also suggests Nora's solitary position in those challenging circumstances. Just as Nora responded to the emergency and failed to take account of her children's needs, so was she seemingly, seemingly unassisted in her own decision. The reader is made aware of Nora's complex position as wife and mother, of the fact that each person belongs to a constellation of relations, of how difficult it is to find optimal solutions in challenging circumstances, of lapses of attention that may occur in the stress, and of the need to attend to the position of everyone involved in a given situation, particularly all those under one's care. The siding under stress and trying to take into account multiple points of view is not unlike what happens in clinical practice. The reader of Tobin's work will notice that the aloof and unreachable mother of the short story gives now way to a woman who is not as lovable as her charming husband was, but whose predicament can now be appreciated and understood. As Kathleen Costello Sullivan observes, uh, having focused, and I'm quoting her, on the impact of neglectful parenting on adult children in earlier novels and stories, Fabine's option to focus now on the grieving perspective of the failing parent humanizes the figure of the flawed mother. She adds that this allows Tobin to provide an imaginative re reconciliation with Nora's flawed humanity with possible personal resonances for him. End of quote. Though I prefer to keep the personal personal, I agree that Tobin's experiment with different points of view highlights how important an awareness of perspective is, how partial any subjective position is, and how relevant it is to attend to others and one's own respective experience, precisely the aspects highlighted by narrative medicine when using literature to teach by indirection as the amount it puts it. Besides this shift in perspective, uh, the scenes in which Nora and her sons watch films together provide relevant insight into the use of fiction and memoir in health humanities. Next slide, please. In the first scene, mother and sons watch Gaslight. Though Nora had seen it before, it strikes her differently now. There was something in the film that she had not remembered. Before it had seemed like a thriller or a sort of horror film, but now there was something else. Ingrid Berman seemed so oddly alone and vulnerable in the film. Every time the camera was on her face, it captured some deep turmoil or uncertainty as much as any fright or horror. She was jittery and oddly estranged from things. Her glances were all nervous. Her smiles had a worried edge. There was a sense of a damaged in her life. Both Donald and Connor had become transfixed by the film. And when the next break came, Donald, that's Dubin's alter ego, moved beside her armchair as well. 
The passage highlights two key aspects. First, it reminds us that timing plays a role in how we engage with a text or film. And this is because we bring our subjectivity into play. The book and the film may remain the same, but we don't. This foregrounds how reading is not a passive activity, but activates our subjectivity. Secondly, the passage foregrounds what cinema and literature are about. Cinema places us in a position akin to life, where we watch others' behavior and try to interpret it. Yet thanks to technical devices such as close-ups, cinema may slow down time and afford a closeness or a vastness that we lack in real life, not to mention all the cues brought in by what is and what isn't shown, by the soundtrack and light, etc. Despite all these cues, interpretation remains a tentative affair, as we see here. In this scene, Nora notices a sense of vulnerability and oddity in Bergman's character, and we may wonder why she notices it now and not before. At the same time, the scene is lender in a literary text that provides access to Nora's mind, something beyond our reach in normal, in real life. So we transcend empirical experience by dropping on her thoughts while remaining confined to her insight. Nora's mental discourse coexists with the non-verbal emotional response of mothers and sons, how the mother and sons huddled in physical closeness. Next slide, please. All three of them watched with hushed worry. It struck Nora that the boys had only, it's the previous one, I think, uh, had only ever before seen adventure films They'd never seen a film uh, like this, and it had something in them that was raw and open, as though they were in a house with a woman who, despite her best efforts, was jittery and worried too, but kept silent about everything that was on her mind. Nora's inaccessible mind is precisely what the novel renders accessible. Conceding that she might be reading too much into Bergman's performance, Nora senses that the film evoked something hidden and strange, as Morris's absence, his body in the grave, must seem hidden and strange to the boys, and wonders how many of the films um, would come back to her with new darker meanings. One such film is Frank Capra's Lost Horizon that we have on this slide, and Nora notices that no matter what the boys watched, it would remind them of their circumstances more than anything that have been said all day in the house. It is therefore not only the literal, but also the evocative power of fiction that affects mother and sons, allowing them to perceive reality from new angles and with a heightened, heightened alertness of vulnerable viewers. So now uh, moving to the last section. Between them, Caldwell's story and Tabine's novel point to the challenges um, yeah, not yet this slide, but um, point to the challenges of narrating traumatic experience and the power and limitations of fiction and memoir. Writing from the rawness of her newborn's um, illness, Caldwell shows the challenges of the disruption caused by a serious illness and the difficulty of articulating it. Uh, in the thickness of the moment, there's no energy left to imagine herself out of herself, only to bear witness to the moment. And yet, as we've seen, her readers are brought imaginatively close to that experience and challenged to imagine what it feels like, though aware of the gap between their vicarious experience and the narrator's first-hand one. Writing in hindsight, Tobin realizes that for all his expertise of an, as a novelist, his childhood grief continues to resist the telling. So if fiction fails Caldwell's narrator when she's immersed in a frightful reality, Hindsight is not enough to salvage Tobin's childhood experience from silence. And though fiction fails Caldwell because she cannot shift perspective, it is precisely the capacious artifice of fiction and hindsight that enable Tobin to shift perspective and reaccess his childhood experience via the mother's perspective. As readers in health humanities, it is important to note these two points. But some experiences are so overwhelming that all we can do is try to survive and bear witness to the moment. And that integrating such experiences into the rest of our lives 
may require the ability to shift perspective and imagine ourselves out of ourselves. Um, <clears throat> So in the case of, uh, and the question that is relevant to health humanities is whether such a shift is exercised not only in the writing of fiction memoir, but also in the reading uh, of them. In the case of Caldwell's story, uh, we've seen that reading it as fiction or memoir doesn't change the fact that we have to imagine ourselves out of ourselves. And the difference between reading fiction or memoir may then have to do with the trust we place on the narrative and with our personal preference for the power of testimony or the detachment of fiction. In the case of Tobin's novel, we've seen how the fictional characters and atmosphere resonate in Mother and Sons. Their engagement with the films involves an outward movement toward the other and an inward movement that involves awareness of the impact of that fictional reality on their biographical reality. As to the trustworthiness of memoir and the fiction, Caldwell's and Tabine's testimonies urge us to pause before assuming that memoir is necessarily more trustworthy than fiction. If we understand trust as implying being closer to lived experience, both stories are closely autobiographical and simply indicate that Memoir and fiction offer two ways of accessing and articulating lived experience. So perspective and voice are critical to both, but both have limits and potentialities. Um, the detachment and the shifts in perspective allowed by fiction may prove enabling when autobiographical accounts fail, but the assumed authenticity of memoir may be compromised by self-censorship to perfect, protect our own and others' privacy. So to conclude, um, I suggest that fictional narratives and memoirs are relevant to uh, healthcare professionals and patients and carers. Both have potentialities and limitations and a preference for one over the other may largely be a personal matter. And yet the testimonies by novelists who became memoirists um, when faced with illness and bereavement may help us understand why fiction failed Caldwell's narrator, and what readers look for in memoirs. Susan Gubar explains why she found others' memoirs help, uh, helpful. She writes, reading and writing about cancer cast a lifeline between me and people whose honesty about mortal encounters mitigated my fearful loneliness and thereby sped it. So if mortal encounters are alienating, reading others' testimonies and writing her own response to the human need for a community of, sort, of sorts. Gubar concedes that she was, um, next, uh, next slide please, that she was nurtured not only by memoirs and testimonials, but also by the novels, plays, films, poems, and paintings. And Eilish Nikwitner, who more referred to already, so next slide please, um, um, also uh, reminds us that reading stories and memories, so when, when her husband died, um, she tells how reading stories and memories of other people's experiences of bereavement helped me survive the first stormy year of grief. And she adds, next slide please, uh, I think it was simply the company of the bereaved that one experiences in these good books, which was itself a conflict the knowledge that somebody understood what losing your spouse is like. So these testimonies help us understand why fiction failed Caldwell's narrator and why the personal testimony of memoir may be compelling to those facing illness and bereavement. Um, testimony may provide some consolation, a lifeline of connectedness through recognition bringing home the fact that this alien experience is after all an integral part of the human experience and that it can be articulated no matter how tentatively. This rule of testimony is important to bear in mind when bringing health humanities to patients and their carers. And it's also important to acknowledge, as Nick Wigner does, that narrative fiction and memoir, next slide, resorts to the same technical devices uh, and reading activates similar 
cognitive and affective processes. And also, so the scenes of mother and sons watching films in Laura Webster also suggest that identification and the shortest or conflict of recognition may be derived both from the representation of experiences similar to our own and of experiences different to our own, but that resonate with our own. So writing and reading fiction and memoir meets human needs that are felt all the more acutely when life borders death. A preference for memoir or fiction may depend on personal taste and circumstances, but both are valuable sources of insight into others' experiences and awareness of our responses to them. The methodology proposed by narrative medicine seeks precisely to develop these habits of outward and inward awareness. And yet, it is not easy to provide a measurable demonstration of how that happens. So I would like to conclude with a quotation from Ruth Felsky. Last slide, second last slide, please. Repeated exposure to differing forms of life may have a gradual, subtle, or inadvertent effect, even if readers can point to specific texts that change their way of thinking. Lines of causality are hard to pin down, and the impact factor of literature is exceptionally difficult to measure. Yet a world without imaginative fiction would be a very different world. And she adds, change can only be a result of many things coming together, not of a single or powerful agent acting alone. And I think this is a humbling reminder. So thank you very much for your time, for your attention, and uh, look forward to questions comments thank you questions. thank you teresa for your engaging paper and also for the perspective it gives us so after your huge lecture it's time to give words to the audience for answers or personal point of views so is there any question from you here do you want to add something to teresa's um, paper well, don't be shy. I, I, I can start, maybe, <laughs> Teresa, if you agree. Uh, oh, I yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. um, I want to just add something and maybe ask you a question, of course, Teresa. I think that the assumption of the paper, uh, it seems to me, is the specificity of memoir and fiction as a literary genre. So you start from that point. I guess, even if I'm thinking that when we write in general, uh, we imagine an audience, even if that the audience is ourselves. So I'm thinking about diaries too and memoir, of course. So I can assume that to write is always an act of fiction in some way. Mm -hmm. From this perspective, and in relation to your lecture, how do you consider contemporary literature when made, built, written, starting from social media's post, mm -hmm. you know, because I work also in publishing yeah. and I know that today novels start from social posts and sometimes podcasts and, you know, they are specific tools from which to start a novel. So I'm wondering how we can address your analysis to our contemporary production where borders are so blurring. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Yeah, I, um, I basically use the examples and testimonies from published works um, mm -hmm. because, of course, first, because I wanted to compare um, the questions raised by, well, basically, I wanted to use two cases uh, that would be roughly equivalent of two authors writing very much out of autobiographical experience, but choosing different approaches. So I wanted to compare things that would be comparable uh, and not to bring, say, additional um, elements into that comparison that might uh, make the comparison uh, be more difficult to handle. <laughs> so yeah. I was feeling, and also I was interested in the fact that some you know, some of the memoirists and many, I was particularly interested in memoirists who tend to be fiction writers, but in a particular moments in their lives tend to memoir, mm -hmm. because that also 
fit the question that I was starting from. Mm -hmm. As you're saying, so writing, whether it's to be published in a book or to be published online, presupposes an audience. So it's a performative gesture. Yes. And the actually the short story, to be in short story there that Horace Beagle and Daniel Spencer focus very much in their reading, they focus very much precisely on the <clears throat> intersubjective frame that is created in the story. So it's a narrator that talks to a past lover who is actually in the story, but it's imagined. And why is that interesting? Because we need to imagine a listener, even when you, we're writing a journal, when we're writing a diary. So we need that kind of um, framework. We need that kind of listener for language to emerge. So I'd say whether the frame is, and whether the medium is a published work, or whether the medium is an online audience, at rock bottom, we're dealing with the need for an interlocutor. So the basic human need is still there. And the basic human need will be for a listener, for someone who listens and hopefully understands, right? Mm -hmm. For someone who listens and hopefully provides, um, yeah, hopefully, understands because that understanding and that, that goes back to say one of the quotes by Alish Nkwithna, um, someone who knows what it's like to go through this. Mm -hmm. Hence also what you have say, uh, and you may have even online patient support groups and uh, you know a number of, uh, of resources that are even created by patient associations where um, patients and families can uh, share their respective experiences and can provide tips and suggestions and all that. So that comes from, from that um, very basic fundamental need, I would say. And, uh, and that need is still there, even when we, we are dealing with published literature and so on and so forth. It just makes, uh, I would say, it lends itself to being analyzed precisely because it's published and public as a result. <laughs> and the fact that uh, many fiction writers end up turning to memoir at a given point in their lives, and they, they tend to be surprised um, by that. Of course, sometimes they do it because the publisher also says, why don't you? Yeah. So there is that always market. have to remember yeah. the mediation of the publisher. That, yeah. that is there is there. that kind of market, which means there is a market for it too, you know. So and these are material circumstances that have to do with the culture and that also interfere uh, or also speak for the current need and the current urge and the current desire for this kind of exchange and this kind of forum in which people can bring their experiences. I would actually be, because I'm, you know, I haven't done research uh, on that. So I would be particularly curious uh, about say, whether in a particular, uh, let's say in a, in a cancer association or Alzheimer's association, a particular um, patient's association, for instance, whether there is, a specific format that everyone tends to follow, you know, because yeah. that is also about that intersubjective space. Yeah. Uh, and it's also about what happens at a, a clinical consultation where the questions asked by the doctor are going to determine to some extent what the patient is going to say and what the patient is going to consider relevant to be shared or not so relevant and so it isn't mentioned and so on and so forth. So uh, again, you know, there, there are parallels, uh, whether you're considering these exchanges 
amongst patients or between patients and professionals and so on. So yes, I was really thinking about this exchange between the audience, so the listeners, and yeah. who is writing when, when you were talking in, in, your, in your paper for, for this. I have that, uh, that, that question, question. Also because sometimes uh, uh, published works to the, yeah. in, in the contemporary uh, narrative uh, comes from uh, internet, so from uh, social posts, social media, and maybe from forum also because publisher uh, in this way are sure to have a great audience and so they want to publish, of course. So I think we see that. Market request. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, I think we see that even uh, related to the pandemic, uh, to the so, pandemic experience, that people who kept blogs or, you know, um, <clears throat> so uh, during the pandemic that those, that material is now coming together in the form of books. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For sure. And it's an excellent medium precisely to write from the thick of experience, yes. you know, as, as, as I suppose we've seen during the pandemic. You didn't know how long it was going to last, where on as it was heading, and so on. So yes. it's kind of a perfect example of this case. And also to analyze the, the, yeah. the, the ability to the readers uh, yeah. and uh, they are uh, what they do uh, and, yeah. and the exchange yeah. with the writer too. At a time when alienation was just, you know, everyone was experiencing yes. kind of profound alienation. So it's kind of a <laughs> exacerbated example of, of all those things, yeah. For sure. Maybe, Cecilia, do you want to add something? Yes, yes, sir. I, I, I would like to ask a question. Hello. First of all, Teresa, thank you. It was a wonderful, wonderful talk. And um, as I was listening to you, I was kind of thinking like you had Lucy Caldwell's uh, t broken texts that were written at the moment uh, when she was in a case of, of extreme, I suppose, the being a mother of an infant uh, in a life or death situation is probably one of the most extreme situations. And then like Elish Gublin, who was writing her memoir, but she's writing it reflectively. If, you, if she's writing it uh, fictionally. And then you finally, you would with, with Colin Tobin. Uh, and uh, as you say, it's very much autobiographical, even though it's fictional. Uh, but yeah. his character, and I think I think it's was it, I think he said this is the longest book. It was the book it took, yeah. it took longest to to write. Um, and so I'm just thinking about distance. You know, like yeah. we have we have three uh, people who write. Uh, principally in a fictional style and at different moments in their life they are reflecting um, on they're kind of ex exercising their 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 uh, their demons through uh, writing which has a different level of fictionalization so I suppose my question is here is it's the it's the distance I, I'm, I'm remembering reading uh, Lucy's uh, excerpts and just feeling a heartbreak you know, there, uh, you, you know, you're talking about reading uh, and going, and it was like um, you were listening to somebody telling you their real story. Um, okay, so here's my question. <laughs> it's 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 a convoluting question. I'm just I'm just thinking about about this and about the fact of writing, like if. Uh, we are not all going to be authors. We, you know, not we. We don't have. We all don't have this capacity to uh, observe, uh, observe, uh, to observe and absorb and distill the human experience and move ourselves into another place. But my question is: if learning to write in a fictional style, understanding fictional mechanisms, uh, how the structures work, if this, if these can help us write our own ways out of trauma uh, in uh, if you know if if we're working with the structure like with a, a narrative structure or creating characters like like Colin Tobin needed to create a character because uh, I as you were speaking as well I was remembering that the mother figure in uh, Blackwater Lightship mm -hmm. which is also autobiographical but very critical of the uh, the mother figure, whereas Nora Webster uh, is is forgiving. So 
So does writing, like the, the, the literary style, does the literary style uh, facilitate um, a catharsis, do you think? Um, I, I kind of, because I'm not a psychoanalyst, I, I specifically didn't want to go there. <laughs> so okay, okay, okay. I'm not really, um, uh, I don't think it is my job as a reader, in other words, yeah, I don't yeah. think it's my job as a reader to even speculate whether it was cathartic for Jodin. Mm -hmm. I suspect it may have been, mm -hmm. but it's that is his business, you know, that, yeah. that is something that I'd say is private. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, you're right that most certainly if you're reading a reader of Tobin, you'll notice that the mother figure is far more sympathetic. Although she is not an easily lovable person mm -hmm. or character, um, you can understand her so much better than in the other novels where the mother figure is always distant and aloof. And it's always seen from the um, emotionally stuck, uh, from the point of view of the emotionally stuck uh, son. So uh, mm -hmm. this time, this shift in trying to see things from the mother's perspective really changes in how she comes across. Now, on uh, I think you point to two things, the issue of timing. timing. I mentioned the timing of reading, but obviously the timing of writing mm -hmm. in regard to the experience that you're writing from is also important. So, uh, Lucy Caldwell is writing from within the experience, which is why, unlike the other stories, there is no past and no future there. There's just the present. Um, Nay Quivner is writing sh very shortly after the experience, and she says that it started from the diary that she kept. And the memoir includes both all the things that went medically wrong and ended up leading to her husband's death, a kind of unexpected death, and her own bereavement. So there are two aspects there, the medical side and the bereavement. She was writing throughout her grief and all those things that were happening. So there was a diary, so she wasn't writing all that. Um, mm. It wasn't much later after the experience. And she was still right, she was writing a memoir, whereas Caldwell kind of presents the story as fiction, but then she acknowledges in interviews and talks that where it comes from. Tobin is writing fiction. He, mm. He does say that the novel took him 13 years to write. He started writing the novel in 2000 when his mother died and he published it in 2013. And so he wrote other things, uh, but you know, the, you, you get the sense that the novel had several incarnations before it took its current uh, shape. Um, and he is creating characters out of experience, but creating characters. So from your question, I would distinguish fiction from narrative because mm -hmm. narrative can be fictional or non-fictional, okay? Mm -hmm. But fiction is when you create characters, even though they are inspired by biographical ones. Whereas narrative, and I think that is your question, mm -hmm. and that is also the techniques that Nick Wiffner is talking about. Narrative has to do with where am I going to start to the story? Where is this story starting? What belongs to the story and what does not belong to the story? Uh, am I telling it in the first person or the second or the third uh, through this or that or the other point of view? So that is about uh, narrative and those concerns, those technical preoccupations uh, affect both fiction and non-fictional. So they apply both to fiction and to non-fiction, mm -hmm. so both to lived experience and to made up experience. Yeah, even even though it is strongly indebted to yeah, yeah. life. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so just something to add, as you were talking about Caldwell in particular, um, so some quotes in your lecture, uh, let me think that maybe the fragmentation, can you hear me? Yes, mm -hmm. sorry. The fragmentation of time and the narrators in her work are like the results of the fragmented self of the author because of the experience of the illness. Mm 
because the experience of the grief. Do you agree with me or not? What do you think? Um, the story, it's, it's the last story in the, connect, in the collection. It's the only one structured in these fragments with these yeah. titles and capital letters. And they feel very much, and some titles are kind of narrative and some are reflective. And this one that is just a title, uh, like we don't even know yet what color his eyes are and so on. That's, that's only the title. And they feel very much like notes, you know, as if you're kind of, so as if you're going through such, an, such a huge anguish uh, and such a chaotic experience, because, you know, of course this is going to be very difficult to read because it's the worst nightmare for any parent. Mm. Uh, and, um, at, but it's as if in the midst of this, utterly despairing situation. She's trying to get to grips with something just by taking notes, because that's very much what those fragments feel like, like, like notes, you know? Um, but, well, she seems to be writing on the iPhone, etc. And also because, you know, in these situations, there's, this is me speculating, but she does mention it. There's so much waiting, waiting for stats, waiting for results, waiting for, the, so uh, and there's so little doing, you know, that writing, taking those notes is something you can do. Not that, it, you know, uh, I think uh, a substantial part of it is about that, just taking notes. She's a writer, so what does she do? She takes those notes, you know, and yeah. About her own experience, yeah. of yeah. course. Yeah. Okay, so in some way, also the style and the narrative form is the result of what she was suffering yeah. and yeah. how she was uh, feeling that. Okay, thank you very much. I don't know if there, there is someone who had something to add. Yes, Antonio Duarte, please. Thank you. So first of all, thank you, Teresa, for, the, for your talk, very interesting topic as, as, as usually. Um, um, I just have I just have a comment and, and then a question. Um, uh, I would like to, for me, is it inevitable um, to come back to this uh, to this topic of the discrimination between uh, uh, memoir and and fiction? Because, as you might guess, from a psychological point of view, mm -hmm. discrimination. Um, in a certain in a certain way, doesn't make much sense. I I, I explain uh, that the uh, the memoir is always a fiction from a psychological point of view because it's a reconstruction, and of course, fiction is always autobiographical, or or can be autobiographical, uh, which which um, which makes me come back to the question of Cecilia, which what would be more cathartic, and I I I, I would say, but this is of course speculating about the issue. I would say that some fiction might be more cathartic than many memoirs, and some memoirs might be more cathartic <laughs> than than uh, much fiction. Also, okay, the number of variables that are involved is so big that uh, it's very difficult to predict. Now. Uh, re regarding the, the the question I would like to to uh, to pose to to Teresa, I like very much your analysis on the limits of uh, um, uh, um, the limits that the um, the text uh, has on creating empathy from the reader, um, and this remind me uh, a, 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 um, a discrimination that um, comes from a psychology of cinema between empathy and sympathy. Yeah. Sy sympathy meaning that we can understand the character from outside uh, without uh, the, the need to feel what he feels. So the question, it's very, it's very direct. The question is that, what is your, what is your, what your, what is your feeling of the demand of the perspective of narrative medicine? Is empathy with the characters necessary from the point of view of uh, narrative medicine, hoping that this empathy generalizes to the clinical context or sympathy 
with characters without empathy would be accepted as enough or even as an alternative? This is a very practical question. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Anthony, for your comment and question. First, I understand that you say that memoir is always a fiction, but I would not fully endorse it. I would agree that it's always a construction, that any narrative is always a construction. Mm -hmm. mm. Be it um, an autobiographical narrative or a completely imagined narrative. Mm -hmm. So I would agree that they are both constructions. But say in literary studies, you do have to distinguish whether, and we only <laughs> uh, whether say, the first person narrator actually coincides with the author, has lived those things that are narrated there, in which case it's life writing or autobiography, or whether the first person narrator is a completely imagined character, in which case it's fiction. It is a construction in both cases to the extent that every narrative is a construction. Um, and that's why the way I tell say there is something that affected me the way I tell it today is going to be different from the way I tell it tomorrow or next week or next month or next year right the memory I have of something uh, is going to be different if I tell it now and if I tell it 10 years from now so when uh, and, and, and that is the same that happens when we view a film and uh, or read a book or whatever we're going to respond differently so I would just call it the construction rather than necessarily a fiction. <laughs> yeah. So then on empathy and sympathy, I kind of deliberately didn't go much into that because it would be a different talk and I didn't have the time to look into that. Um, uh, what do you care? I do not think that empathy, sh uh, empathy should be the touchstone of narrative medicine. I don't even think that uh, because I think it's as important, and I also don't think that the only two ways you can respond to a character are empathy or sympathy. There could be a character that you just hate, you know, <laughs> that you completely reject, that you find, you know, obnoxious and uh, objectionable and so on and so forth. I would say what's important in narrative medicine is precisely to become aware, to try to understand what's going on in the story, regardless of what kind of story it is, whether it's uh, you know a text, a film, or an image, and also to understand your response to it, because that is part of trying to learn a bit more about others and others' experience, and about getting to know yourself a bit better. Mm -hmm. um, and this is important, and why is this important? because we need to know our subjective position. We need to know whether, say, we tend to experience prejudice about this particular kind, you know, oh, this is a whining patient. You know, I'm not really, and if I believe this patient is a whining person who just complains and complains with irrelevant complaints, I'll probably not even pay attention to what the patient is going to say, right? Mm -hmm. So I'd say, it's, it's not even about empathy or sympathy, but about trying to understand what's going on, about trying to understand how our subjectivity is being activated. That, that, that would be kind of my <laughs> position. I, I always think that when people keep going on about empathy, that maybe it hasn't been properly thought through. Because I don't just want an empathic doctor. I want a doctor that doesn't minimize my complaints, right? And that is prepared to listen to them, to pay attention. So attention is something that is important and I suppose something that narrative medicine needs, uh, wants to promote. Um, and I need a doctor that knows, you know, what they're doing and <laughs> what they need to do. Uh, to, uh, so it's about acknowledgement of my position and of the vulnerability of my position as a patient, rather than necessarily empathy. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm sure. Yeah.
Okay. Thank you. Antonio, do you want to add something or it's okay? No, no. Thank you. Thank you very much for the reaction. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And I'll gladly keep talking about that at some other time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, for sure. You you will have other uh, some time to other time to discuss yeah. these points. Uh, well, I think that uh, Antonio was the last uh, question in today's session. So before concluding uh, our session, I need just to correct my previous words because our next lecture. Uh, on October 20, not November the 8th, will be entitled Narrative from Form to Function with Professor Isabel Fernandez. So sorry for my, uh, for my mistake. But now it's time to thank you very much, all of you, and also to thank you, Teresa, again, of course. Um, so see you soon, and see you next month with our next appointment, I guess. Okay. And uh, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.